Hey, so special treat today. Eric Johnson is in town. Eric's generally out in California, right? Yeah. Um, he is our tech columnist, tech guru, knows everything there is to know basically about all things technology, which is why I asked him to hang out with me because I know nothing. All right, so but we're going to start with some three, three big stories that are happening in tech right now. All right. All right. You mentioned the battle of the platforms. I like this, but we're really talking about like Amazon versus Google versus who? Yeah, um, just talking about cloud infrastructure platforms. You know, um, it's been a booming market over the last you know several years. You know, as like a lot of corporations uh, move workloads that were previously in their own data centers to these uh, giant like cloud infrastructures that uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, IBM, various other companies have uh, created. And you know they just uh, like the convenience of uh, not having to like manage their own infrastructures. They also just like the speed at which they can uh, load new apps or load new services that they might want to deploy. They um, also like all the uh, advanced services that some of these platforms now provide in areas like IoT or analytics, various other areas. And uh, the market's just been uh, growing very rapidly, and it's been good news for Amazon and to a lesser extent Microsoft and Google. Who who who's winning? Uh, Amazon is easily the biggest of the bunch. I think you know they're like some, on something like a fourteen billion dollar annual run right now for Amazon Web Services. Wow! You know the cloud infrastructure platform, and um, I think they're estimated to have like something like a forty percent plus share of cloud computing and storage and like other basic infrastructure services. Holy cow! And like no one else is uh, even at ten percent right now. I think Microsoft might be around seven or eight percent, and then everyone else is smaller than that. I don't. I don't know if people associate Amazon with all that stuff. Yeah, it's uh, funny how like uh, AWS, as they call it, you know, was built out. You know, they originally built out. Wait, this, what does AWS stand uh, for? Amazon Web Services. Okay. Um, they originally built out this infrastructure just for their, you know, e-commerce business. You know, they needed their own servers and their own storage and whatever else. And they realized, you know, there's value in uh, leasing this stuff out to other people. You know, that other people will pay. You know, if you know, they provide a high level of service, they can allow people to like, uh, you know, load, run these workloads faster than they could. If they had to, you know, build out their own server infrastructures, and uh, the business just, you know, quickly took off. It's amazing. Like Amazon's everywhere. I mean, it, it's in all aspects of our lives and aspects that we don't even know about. Because I think people like me assume, uh, presume Amazon is Prime, <laughs> because mainly because the delivery guy comes to my house like every day, yeah. and 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 who yeah. knew about all the back stuff? Yeah, I mean, uh, their ambitions, you know, are clearly limitless. You know, and it's off the like the four or five, you know, like giant consumer tech companies that everyone knows about, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, you know. I feel like Amazon is the one that has the most unconditional love among people. You Agreed. Know? You know, in terms of how people just seem to swear by, you know, Apple has its loyalists, but there are other people who don't care for it. Right. It's just everyone is uh, obsessed with Amazon. Right, almost, and almost doesn't, don't care that it doesn't make a lot of money either. Yeah, I mean, he you gets know, to buy like all the time, doesn't he? That's by design, you know. I think uh, analysts, you know, know that uh, Amazon could, you know, produce billions in cash flow if they wanted to. You know, they're just investing so much in their fulfillment infrastructure and their video content, in building out the data centers for AWS and in so many other things. You know, people uh, trust trust Jeff Bezos and you know his lieutenants to you know yeah. eventually make it pay off. So, if you had to pick a stock right now, would you pick what? Which which one would you pick? Um, which like tech company in yeah, general? Yeah, Amazon. You said Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM. Who wins? Who do you well, pick? You know, um, these companies have you know large businesses outside the cloud infrastructure. Right. You know, it's just not uh, about that. Of course. But um, you know, of those companies, you know, I'd say like uh, Microsoft and Google might be the ones I'd be most partial to right now. You know, Amazon's a great company. It's just uh, had such a huge run up. Right, right, right. And uh, you know, it's the valuation's a little high because of that. I feel like uh, Google, you know, the multiples are still fairly reasonable. You know, it might be a little stretched right now. You know, they've had a bit of a run mm -hmm. up too, but it's not too much for, you know, how dominant they are in their core, you know, search ad business. Then you also factor in things like YouTube and, you know, all these right, other, you know, platforms that have over a billion active users. Do you place any weight in Amazon Handmade, especially with the holidays coming up? Um, do I personally like? I mean, feel, do you, is it going to make a make or break? The, um, no, it's a small percentage of your business. You know, I feel like uh, Etsy is still the leader. You know, and when it comes to like craft and vintage goods, right? You know, Amazon. You know, I think they saw an opportunity to you know get in on that business a little bit, but uh, it's uh, it doesn't seem to be a large percentage of their like e-commerce volumes right now. I mean, the margins must be there though. Why get in it? 
Um, you know, it's um, they can make decent margins. You know, when they're providing these uh, services to third-party sellers, like they are with handmade. You know, they'll collect a commission. They might provide like shipping services as well. They might provide advertising services so the sellers can promote themselves. So you know, they can make some money out of it. Yeah, I just don't think it's uh, that part large of a business right now. Is it now. all part of like this notion that it's a, it's the one-stop shopping? So like now I could buy fruits and vegetables on Amazon Fresh. I could order my kid new sneakers, and if I need a little cute homemade gift for the holidays, I go there too. I never have to leave. Yeah, there is something to that. You know, they want to be a one-stop shop. Yeah. They want you know people to load the Amazon app. You know, just buy things you know via Prime and not like look at any other website. Just assume everything's taken care of. You know, through that app. So you know they're. That mindset, it, I'm sure, it played a role in launching something like Handmade. It kind of is taken care of. Like, I mean, at least in my house, I feel like a lot of other houses too. I'm right. sure. It's, I order light bulbs now, and I'm amazed that at, that they come and they're not broke. Like, they're so well packaged. Yeah. it's amazing. Um, okay, so second topic you brought up was autonomous driving. I love this idea because someday I am not actually going to have to drive kids to school. Yeah, I mean, if you live in an urban area, you live in an area with a ton of traffic, where you know rush hours a nightmare, you know, it can, it can be a, you know, just very, a lot more convenient, you know, it can save a lot of time and you, if you can, um, you know, devote that time that you were previously driving to doing other things. Right. You know, you're pulling out your laptop maybe and getting some work done or whatever else, you know, the, I don't think, you know, we've, you know, fully thought through all the social and economic impacts, you know, it could have over the long run, you know, how much uh, parking space it could also get rid of, you know, if you have these fleets of like autonomous cars, they can call on demand and, they don't cost much because there's no driver there. You know, that's another factor, you know, that could like... Uh, oh, so that you're saying then people won't own cars anymore? Yeah, some people. You know, I'd say more in urban areas, you know, like if you... I think if you live in suburban or rural areas, it's going to take a longer time for people to give up their cars. But, you know, if you live in an area where um, the distances aren't that long, you know, and, uh, you know, you can have like a thick network of these um, autonomous like cars that are like all over the place, they can call on demand whenever. I mean... Trusting it, making sure it's safe, that conversation aside, doesn't that, that challenges Uber and Lyft, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's one big reason Uber's been investing so much in autonomous driving. I feel like they're behind Google and Tesla there, but they you know, see it as a major long-term threat. You know, if they don't control the technology, if their technology isn't good enough, and they have to like, uh, depend on a third party like Google or Tesla, then there's a risk that those companies could like, uh, support some other you know, ride-sharing platform, you know, offer their technology to them. And then mm -hmm. Uber would be kind of left out of the picture. I'm just thinking as a mother, right? Like if you, can, if you get this autonomous driving thing down, it's safer for me to put my kids in a car with no one <laughs> than a driver that I don't know what he or she is going to do to my kids. Yeah, safety is uh, definitely going to be one of the big selling points, you know? Right. You know, some people have speculated in the long run they could even like ban um, regular human driving. hope that doesn't happen. I like driving, but... Uh, you know, oh, it's you can could, take it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm over it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a possibility for sure, you know, that uh, down the line, you know, with you know, autonomous cars are just much safer, you know. So so when, when are you talking, like, you know, what's down the line to you? Is it next year? Is it five years? You know, I think we might be, like, uh, just a few years away from having, like, something around, like, level four autonomy. Which, which is, is it can uh, Level four autonomy is when a car can mostly take over for drivers, not all the time, but like in a solid majority of situations, it can take over for them. And, you know, I think we might be a few years away from seeing that. You know, Google and Tesla have been mo both making a lot of progress in that direction. But like Google is uh, going to be uh, rolling out this uh, fleet of like uh, self-driving cars that will actually have no human driver inside them, even to monitor anything um, in Arizona. You know, it's just a test for now, but it shows that like uh, even on, if they're doing it on a limited set of roads, it's close. Yeah, you know, it's getting I there. would think, though, like, if you're driving highway for a long period of time, that's probably an easy thing. Not easy, but that's something an autonomous car could probably handle. Yeah, it's right? uh, something, you know, like uh, Tesla cars can at times do now, you know, where, uh, you know, if you're going from one spot to another on the highway, you know, they can just uh, take care of that. Then you might need to drive on the local roads. So what do you do? Hop over into the passenger seat or do you just let the car go? Um, yeah, I think, you know, you just activate the autopilot mode on the Tesla car. You know, Tesla recommends you keep your hands on the wheel while you're doing that. So you activate it, but meanwhile, you can check your phone. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah, I mean, they tell people, you know, put your hands on the wheel, but in practice, a lot of people don't. You know, they so just who, who's winning the autonomous driving world right now? Um, like I've said, um, I feel like Google and Tesla are like, uh, you know, ahead of like uh, everyone else right now, just in terms of the R&D investments they've made and 
in terms of how many miles you know their self-driving cars have logged. In you know, a ton of other companies are um, also like investing in the space. You know, yeah. most of the big automakers have kind of like realized that autonomous driving will eventually happen. Right. I mean, think of trucking. Right. The whole trucking world could be changed forever. Yeah. Those guys all could be out. Uh, as it is, they can't find people to drive trucks now. Right. But the whole trucking business could be turned on its head. Right. I mean, you know, that's one of the things Tesla was promoting when they right. unveiled their truck. You know, it's still away. It's away from you know being fully autonomous. But you know they really uh, you know talked up um, like the autopilot features you know that can like uh, allow a truck to stay in its lane that it can prevent jackknifing that can mm -hmm. you know automatically hit the brakes you know if there's something goes wrong. Right, those poor guys they fall asleep. They're driving for hours. Um, that's pretty cool though. But so you know my kids are in high school. So you're saying they will see it by the you know by the time they get out of college they'll see something. Yeah, I think the odds are pretty good. You know, like I said, I think level four is a pretty good possibility. By that point, it's pretty crazy. All right, and the other big thing that you and I were talking about before is this infamous iPhone. I don't know what we call it. Do we call it the 10? Oh yeah, Apple X? insists on it being called the 10. Everyone's uh, calling it the X anyway. Right, because okay. it's the Roman numeral X. Why? Well, I mean, like, why do that? Actually, why yeah. cause the confusion? Yeah, if you pay a thousand dollars for it, you should be able to call it whatever you want. Yeah. I'm telling you, I think you should call it for dinner too. Like, <laughs> I think it should be able to make you dinner. Um, tell us about this phone, and do you think it's worth it? Well, I think, you know, if you're, um, you know, a high-end iPhone user, you know, and uh, you're someone who really puts a lot of uh, value in, like, your smartphone experience, you know, your people, you know, will often spend four or five hours a day, you know, on their phones at one point or another. You know, if you're doing that, it's, you know, that big a part of your life, then it might be worth it, you know, just given the quality of the display, given the quality of, you know, all the, the other features they added, like uh, this advanced front camera that can... Uh, handle like face on, you know, that can unlock the phone just by um, pointing it at your face. You know, they call it Face ID. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, just um, Apple put a lot of work into getting the little details right, I feel, with the uh, interface. You know, it takes a little bit of adjusting. But, but you were saying you're not an iPhone user. Uh, no, nah, I have an LG V20 myself. But yet you're impressed with it. Yeah, I mean, I feel at this point, you know, um, both, you know, iOS and Android have some unique strengths. But um, they get the job. They each get the job done their own ways for yeah. the vast majority of smartphone users. And Apple has, you know, sky high customer loyalty rates. And mm -hmm. if if you're hooked on the Apple ecosystem, you know, if you're a longtime iPhone user, you know, and if you can afford the phone, then it could be worth getting. Because we're talking a thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, do you think that this will be like the hot seller this holiday? It's going to be one of the big ones. You know, supply constraints are still kind of an issue, but they have been improving a little bit. Which means I, the phone will be available for people. Um, for most people, yeah. Like right now, the shipping times are down to two to three weeks. You know, early on, like uh, they were around four to six weeks. Mm. So gradually, they're getting better. So if you had to pick, would you buy the phone or the stock <laughs> right now? That's a tough question. You know, it's. Um, I feel like some of the easy money has been made with Apple, but the stock is still pretty cheap. You know, it's still only trading like around fifteen times. You know, forward earnings. That's before accounting for all the cash they've got offshore. So. It's still not a bad deal, you know, especially when you look at some of these uh, consumer stocks that are uh, trained for over like 20 times forward earnings. You look at like McDonald's or Nike, companies like that. And they're, they've probably got uh, less growth, you know, in the near term than Apple does just because the iPhone cycle. So the stock is, you know, still pretty reasonable. You know, I feel like it's not going to like uh, double as easily as it did like yeah. over the last yeah, yeah. like 15 months. But I don't, it's unlikely that it's, you know, going to, you know, crater either. What's the competitor to the iPhone X or 10, whatever we're calling it? Is there a similar phone out there? Um, you know, there are phones with edge-to-edge -edge displays, you know, like Samsung's Galaxy Note 8 and the S8. You know, there's some various other Android phones that have created edge-to-edge -edge mm -hmm. displays. I feel like uh, Apple, uh, there's, there, the iPhone X's design is a little sleeker in some ways. Because I think they're always accused of like, being a step behind. Um, I don't know. I feel like uh, in terms of the front camera, they are a step behind. Yeah. You know, the, True depth camera that you know can do like 3D face sensing. That's something Android makers might not have for a couple of years. You know, I think they're all like scrambling now to match Apple. Uh, in terms of display quality, I think Samsung's up there with Apple right now. Yeah. You know, I thought like uh, in terms of the user interface, Apple did some unique things that um, arguably put them ahead of Android. You know, in terms of like uh, getting rid of the home button at the bottom, but still uh, not also having any soft keys at the bottom like Android phones do, right. taking up space. So there are you know, various things Apple's done in that respect. Um, the processor inside of the iPhone 10 and also the iPhone 8, the uh, A10 Bionic, that's easily the fastest smartphone processor right now. So there are things like that. Apple has an advantage. But um, at the same time, you know, a lot of people love Android. You know, 
it's you know yeah. different strokes for different folks in some ways. You know that. You know, no, some I, I think you're either you're either people. on the Apple side of the fence or the Android, right? You, mm -hmm. The two don't meet. Yeah, they don't seem to cross over. Your your house is either Android or yeah. Apple. I feel like. Yeah, it can be. You know, I mean, now and then you'll have some people switch, but yeah. you know, loyalty rates are pretty high for both. Right. And part of it's just because you know people download so many iPhone apps or so many Android apps. You know, and they'll um, get hooked on the various services that right. come with each OS. And so uh, there's a switching cost involved if they want to jump to the other one. All right, well, we're going to have to see how this does and, or how many Christmas trees this phone ends up under this holiday season. Eric, next time you're in town, we got to do this again. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah.